I was asked to do this presentation on big data, and um, I have to confess that um, when I was writing the presentation uh, yesterday, um, <laughs> sorry about that, it's not my fault. <laughs> um, when I was writing the presentation, um, I started really asking myself the question, what the hell is big data? I mean, what is it? I mean, who's doing a big data project? Come on, there's more of you doing something like that. Any, you can call anything a big data project these days, apparently. Um, so to give me a bit of background, um, I work in uh, the strategic customers. Uh, so I look after the whole of EMEA for our, our most strategic, interesting customers, people doing exciting stuff, and our larger ones as well. Um, and the, the object of our, uh, our team is really to look at the life cycle of a customer, the lifetime of the customer. Because it's not just about getting on the platform, it's about succeeding on the platform. And as part of that, I've been dealing a lot with people starting to use data. So I pulled up a word cloud about what big data is. So you get things like you know, data, obviously, and big, obviously. Um, but <laughs> you get things like petabytes, and storage, science, large. And then you also, I've also heard these things are three Vs, you know, velocity and volume. And to be honest, none of these really satisfied me. I don't think they are. So I'm going to start with by going on a little bit of a trip to look at the essentials, the fundamentals of what is data. So I've got a picture here. And what I'm trying to show you on this is data. These, I hope you can see, pixels. And everyone knows how pixels are defined. Bits of red, bits of green, bits of blue. And you get all the colors you want from red, green, and blue. So every single one of these pixels is a little bit of code. And we can see, obviously, that there's a difference between them, which is an important concept to know, that because there's a difference, we can actually see them. We know that they're different from the pixels next to each other. But let's take this a little bit further, because this forms part of a picture. Now then, what's the first thing you saw on this picture? Who saw leaves first? Who saw trees first? One, two. Who saw water? There you go. Now, what's interesting about that little experiment is the data hasn't changed. The data hasn't changed. But we're all seeing different things. So I'm sort of leaning on the work of a guy called Gregory Bateson, who was a, uh, a cyberneticist cyberneticist, I should say. Um, I have to practice that. Um, he was writing probably about 20 or 30 years ago. And he says, yes, data is about measuring differences. But what's important and what's meaningful and what gives us understanding is a difference that makes a difference. So we bring an intentionality, if you like, to the data that we see. This is where meaning arises. We are flooded all the time with data. But actually finding the meaning in it, the significance of it, is really important. So you're out buying a car. If you don't care about color, it's not going to differentiate one car from another. You, someone might say, well, this is a green one, this is a red one. You say, well, actually, I don't care about that. What I care about is the miles to the gallon or 0 to 60. They're differences that make a difference. And this is where I think big data is really founded. Because when you go back to these, has anyone seen this Gartner? study that was done probably about two or three years ago about the development of business intelligence. If you think about how we developed in our businesses, we start out with really these very sort of macroscopic reporting levels. So we're looking at the financials. We're looking at the volumes in and the volumes out. It's relatively simple. They're things we can measure because people really have to measure these and write them down. This started before computers. So there's a capacity limit here. Because the key thing about understanding intentionality is that it requires a human being to be involved. To get meaning out of data requires human activity. So as we see this has grown, we've tried to push up this curve. I was talking to um, a government agency, and actually also some schools recently. They were very interested in big data. And someone put their hands up and saying, well, it's all very well you talking about data. But on the ground, there's teachers who are filling out forms for more than 50% of their day. You know, and we see this in our businesses, this increasing bureaucracy 
because management are saying we need more data, more information to get more insight. But all the time when it has an impact on people to collect it or people to interpret what's happening on the ground to fill out forms, we're wasting productive time. Who's, who's got a CRM system in their business? Most people, I hope. Who has problems with data quality in their CRM system? Most people. In fact, everyone who's got a CRM system. Why is that? Because we're trying to force people to put data in the system. And who puts data in the system? Anyone here puts data in CRM systems? Who enjoys it? No one. It's a ball ache. You know, it, it's, it's complicated. You don't want to do it. It's a waste of time. There's things you want to be out there doing instead of just filling out forms. And this is the big challenge we've had in this development. Now, big data, as we so call it, I think is really the answer to this challenge. And, you know, when you look at this trend of human input, what we're actually trying to do is start shifting what's possible. And there's a, a bit of a history to that which I want to explore. Um, I want to start with this. Now, I used to work in space technology, so I worked on this project with the European Space Agency probably about, well, give my age away, 15 years ago. Um, it launched about 12 years ago. I think it's about end of life now. This was a satellite called Envisat, environmental satellite. Um, and it was actually one of the biggest satellites that they'd launched from a scientific perspective. It's about the size of a bus. You can see people down there. And up here, these pictures there, are pictures of their mission control systems. So they're launching, I think it's a two, three, four hundred million pound piece of kit. That thing goes wrong, who's going to go and fix it? You can't get anyone up there. So everything you're ever going to know about the, this really, really valuable piece of kit, you have to be able to measure it. So in a satellite mission control system, these pictures that show you here, you measure everything. You measure what we call telemetry streams, the temperatures, you're measuring voltages, you're measuring um, whether it's dark or it's hot. Um, everything you can measure, you measure. You bring this down into the control systems and monitor it. And from the combination of those factors, you can start doing incredibly sophisticated diagnoses. So you know that a certain switch is, is running uh, and it's starting to, to go, then you will switch to the redundance because you always have redundance when you're building these sort of things. Now, a couple of hundred million dollars, a couple of hundred million pounds. How many people work in businesses worth more than that? Come on, all of those that have got more than 500 employees should be putting their hand up here. How much of your businesses are you measuring? How much have you instrumented? You know, this is an interesting question because we kind of have different mindsets. We just assume we can dump on the guys at the bottom to fill out forms. It's not productive. And it's actually making it very difficult for us to get to this monitoring and this predictive approach to data. So I wanted to share something. This is something we did at I.O. last year. Was anyone at I.O. last year, 2013? Anyone could get a ticket? It's a pain in the backside. The only reason I got to go was I volunteered to do a talk. Um, that's the only way you get there in Google. <laughs> um, but they had this very interesting experiment going on with data sensing. And what it was doing was starting to think about what happens if we start instrumenting an event like Google I.O. So these are moats. These are little, um, quite cheap, a few sort of maybe tens of dollars uh, fully built. They, collect, they connect wirelessly. Um, and what we did is we put them all around the event. And they're measuring things like noise volumes, they're measuring footfall, air quality, all sorts of little scientific uh, measurement instruments. And as you can see the event, what happened is we started generating data with these things. Um, and here, what we're doing, I'll just sort of point through. Here we've got um, using the Google API endpoints called cloud endpoints. This is externalizations of Google's API infrastructure. So um, you know, if you've got sort of devices out in the field, it's a no-brainer to be using that, completely scalable. Dropping the data into App Engine, doing a bit of pre-processing, pre backing it up into cloud storage. And the reason we were doing that at the time is because the streaming API wasn't available. It is now. And then from there, it was being analyzed into both BigQuery and Compute Engine um, before it was then visualized. And this is where the analysis comes on, which is uh, where the interesting bit. Now, what's interesting about this is that's where people get involved. So 
you're collecting this raw data, you're setting up basically pipelines of information and bring it to a point where the analytics can, can, can basically process hundreds of millions of rows of data in real time so that the analyst can have a, a sort of a conversation with the data at that point. What we're not doing is getting people to walk around these things with a notepad and take down, I mean, they do with my, they do with my gas meter, right? It's crazy. Either that or they make me type it in, which is even crazier. Um, I don't even know where it is. So, you know, here are some of the graphs we're getting off with the Tableau. Um, and, you, could, you know, you can see actually where the concert was, for example, and the green at the far side here. But you also start seeing some real correlations between things like air quality, between footfall. Now, in some respects, it's quite basic. But being able to sort of visualize the data in this way, we start to see people apply this to a retail environment. You know, what can you tell about how people are walking around stores en masse, not just as a one-off experiment, but every day? You know, this is the idea of actually being able to instrument our businesses isn't that hard, taking these concepts here. All the tools are there to process the data. And what's important is you get in these very low-level data patterns, which then you know enough about to be able to start seeing things which really matter to you. You don't really care whether it's loud or it's not, unless the implication of that is that something else more important is happening. I'll go on to talk about that a little bit more. So I want to come back to this question, what is big data? And in my mind, there's three things that are really important to think about when we're talking about big data. The first, you want to look for telemetry streams. So we're talking about telemetry with the satellites. We're talking about telemetry coming off those sensors. But we're looking for low-level data which doesn't involve people having to go out with forms and collect them, unless you can convince people to do it through crowdsourcing or something like that. But generally speaking, you don't want any of your employees doing, spending their time filling out forms if you can help it. Second, it's often very raw very factual, and it's non-interpreted. And this has been the problem with dealing with data at this sort of volume, because you get tons of this stuff. And I think this is where the idea of big data comes out. So building on that, you have this telemetry data. What we need to start looking for are proxies. So what does it mean where the air quality is down? So OK, there's air quality down. But actually, you can start telling about what people's state's going to be like what the retention might be like. If the temperature in the room's going up and the air quality is coming down, actually, what's the quality of that feedback going to be like in that particular room? I should have some in here, really, shouldn't I? I've been gassing all day. Um, but actually, these become important indicators for KPIs because it could be, um, you know, we, we could take a feedback from an event like this, but it could actually be affected by some of these exogenous factors. You know, how many of you are asleep means I only get half as much feedback as the previous guy. Um, no one's asleep. Well, no one I can see anyway. Um, and then the third point is actually something I really want to pick, pick up on um, uh, when we're looking at the, the talk previously. You see with App Engine and what Stuart was saying about this ability to experiment. Tom mentioned it as well. We need to be agile because we don't understand this data. We don't understand what proxies might come out of it. So being able to sort of take crunch of trillion rows of data and say, actually, no, there's nothing in that and then crunch another trillion and find something else, that becomes important. So Barack showed this slide, Google, and everything that's behind it. And sure, there's that kind of real raw power that comes out of the data centers. But a lot of Google's technologies have been data related. And if you look back to um, some of the papers, actually, that were, have been produced over the last, well, 10 years, more. Uh, has anyone been to research.google.com? Yeah, intertechnical papers, we publish quite a lot there. And if you went back and looked at the papers from 2002 to 2004, you'll find papers on something called the Google File System, something called MapReduce. Anyone heard of those? Yeah, good, <laughs> more. So um, I, I actually have an email someone forwarded to me, because I wasn't in Google at the time, um, from a guy called Jeff Dean, who wrote this email one Sunday afternoon and he, he sent it out to the engineering teams, which was very small at the time. He says, I've just written a couple of libraries this weekend, one called Mapper and one called Reducer. And we should all start using them, which we duly did. 
Now, those two papers, which were written shortly after he sent that email out, um, were taken by a guy called Doug Cutting and turned into something called Hadoop. So Hadoop is an open imp implementation of these libraries here. And it's been very gratifying, I think, to see that it really get its light of day in the sun over the last two or three years. But um, we didn't really stop. I mean, the big table paper in 2006 was the, um, what really seeded the NoSQL database movement. So anything you do on things like Cassandra and MongoDB, the principles of eventual consistency, NoSQL database, how you manage data at scale, came from actually that paper there. Dremel, I'm going to talk a bit more about that. Colossus is our replacement for Google File System, which we don't run anymore because it wasn't good enough. Uh, it wasn't scalable enough in a funny way. Um, and actually, things like Dremel, things like Spanner have been replacing pretty much internally the MapReduce libraries that we used to use because actually there's more efficient ways of doing some of this analysis. But let's just have a look at one of those. Let's look at the, the Dremel because what we're trying to do is rather than just write a paper, we want to actually externalize these technologies directly. So BigQuery, which we're going to see more about actually in the next talk with Google Analytics, um, it's a very basic sort of API, or it's a very simple UI with a very small picture up there of it. But what it's trying to do is sort of say, you know, if I'm generating log telemetry streams off our infrastructure, let's say, um, the health of our hard drives, we've got quite a lot of those. What can we tell from that data? But you know what? I'm going to have to crunch a trillion rows of data to get to that information because I'm getting more than a trillion data points off that a week. And I want to be able to play with that as a data scientist. I don't want to set that off, come back three hours later once the map reduce is finished and see what the answer was. So the reason we built Dremel was to build a system which allowed us to do a real, hardcore statistical analysis on a trillion rows of data in like 15, 20, 30 seconds. So that's what Dremel does. We externalized that as something called BigQuery. Um, that came out probably about 20 months ago. And I think we've probably done about six launches since then. Um, so it's a very exciting product in that respect. Um, it's being used in a lot of really interesting spaces. So I'm going to take you through two or three examples from customers I'm working with. Um, Barack mentioned earlier games. You might think a game on your mobile phone is a bit of fun. But I'm telling you, the people who create them can do very, very well out of them. The best games, though, um, are making huge efforts to stay engaged. So um, there's a company called GameSys that I've worked with here um, who use a lot of BigQuery, actually, uh, to, they probably take about 50 to 70 billion event rows a month into BigQuery to do analysis. And what they're analyzing in that is actually the, the quality of the levels. So if you're playing a level on a game, this is actually from a, a different product called Claritics, but um, you, again, using BigQuery, same idea. They're able actually to see the engagement of users in that campaign and where those users start dropping off. So they'll be able to say, actually, I can see I get to a certain level and there must be a problem at that level because everyone gets to it and hardly anyone get, getting past it. So they're able to start tweaking in real time. Day after day, they will change the game behavior so that people stay engaged and continue to enjoy the game. Now, you know, they've got a lot of customers, but how many people here are in businesses who've got customers? Yeah, that, that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> yeah? How, how would you like to know how engaged they are? or what you're doing that could increase that engagement. And of the telemetry streams that you can identify in your business, what would be relevant to you to start pulling out of that information? So gaming's a big one. These guys use um, BigQuery not just actually to analyze, but they also do some very clever things to do with engagement. So they know their users well enough to know sort of what times they will play so that they can start queuing up emails using App Engine task queues to say, look, we know you're getting stuck around this level. Here's a little bit of a giveaway, and we'll send it at 8 o'clock in the morning because typically that's when you play the game. You know, very, very sophisticated. This was a team of about eight people uh, building this. Uh, you know, they're also using some of the more sophisticated stuff like the prediction API that Stuart mentioned earlier. Um, so they're not the only games customer. Got lots of them started to use BigQuery. Um, now, in a more traditional sense, what about things like data warehousing? If you'd asked me a year ago, I said, well, it's not a data warehouse. That's not what it's for. 
Um, but actually, we had an interesting thing with Motorola this year, because um, Motorola has obviously been working very closely with Google over the last year, a couple of years. And what they'd started doing is saying, actually, we're getting huge amounts of data from our phones. You know, if you're making phones, you want to know, where is it crashing? You know, what, what, when I put a, push a new upgrade out, what's the response of that been like? Has it been better? If we start moving buttons around, does it work better for, the, for those users, or did it work? You know, what, was it a, a better experience? Was it not? So actually, they collect huge amounts of data. Again, using App Engine, very familiar pattern, to start collecting that data, a very scalable platform. Um, do some pre-processing, and then they were writing it and backing it up down in cloud storage. Now, often, this is where people are stopping. I'm going to collect this data. I'm going to put it somewhere, and I'm going to back it up, hopefully as cheaply as possible. You know, how many of us got stores of data in our organization which are sitting there taking up disk space? And it may have value in it, but we're not accessing that value. So what they started doing was actually ingesting these into BigQuery. And I'm breaking this out. I mean, BigQuery is actually two things. It's the query engine itself, but actually the storage layer itself is very, very powerful. Um, so a lot of structured storage. And the reason this was important is because they'd already built uh, on an on-premise uh, Hadoop cluster, very big Hadoop cluster, a lot of their business workflows. So what they did is they migrated the Hadoop cluster over onto Compute Engine, and then were able to access the BigQuery storage layer directly to start do, um, basically maintaining and transitioning over those workflows. Uh, after time, actually, a lot of those workflows, which are quite complex here, migrated very naturally up into BigQuery. So um, because it's, it's, it was a lot simpler to maintain, a lot simpler to keep up and running. There's still some going on down here because MapReduce is good for some, some use cases. So again, we're seeing Hadoop used with BigQuery workflows. And then they had probably about 100, to one or 200 business analysts sitting on top. And all you're providing to the business analyst is the console, or you're providing them with Tableau. Or in some cases, people are writing a, you know, 20 lines of script in the back of a spreadsheet, which is updating the spreadsheet every day. You see that, uh, you know, in the gaming companies, they do a lot of that. So that every day, the managers can get the, their phone out, open a spreadsheet, and on the spreadsheet, they've got all the data updated from crunching, you know, a few hundred million rows of data to get the latest status of how the game's performing. Um, very, very agile approach. Um, in, in, interestingly, one of the things is a lot of this stuff is actually going away um, and um, since the release of the streaming API, which Barack mentioned earlier, a lot of that's, that collector use case, which used to be quite complicated, is getting a heck of a lot simpler. 100,000 rows a second, 100,000 inserts a second is, is fast enough for most use cases. And if it's not, then we can just shard it and get double that. A um, couple of other examples, um, interactions marketing. These guys used to do um, these sort of front of store marketing activities. Uh, so they do a lot of research. And one of the things they were finding is their results were being skewed a heck of a lot by weather data, or by the weather, actually, in reality. So what they started doing is pushing this data into BigQuery in order to do big joins with weather data at a very granular level. Um, so you know, we're going to talk, I think, later um, with some of the guys from Datasift, which I think is a classic example of where you're able to take uh, data streams either from inside your business or from social or from weather sources and then join them and do correlation analysis with your own telemetry streams. So you get this ability to bring multiple data streams together to get insight, which is a really useful way of enriching the data that you already have with other publicly accessible data. Um, Shine's another really interesting one. Um, and, and I like this one because it's a bit like Stuart said earlier, that you know, they decided um, they were having a major problem in that they were trying to sample, I think, 1% of their data and having major issues in managing that data volume. Um, so they came to BigQuery and they found that they could load the whole amount of data in. And instead of taking it three or four hours to analyze, um, they can actually analyze it in less than a minute. And that's a whole data set rather than 1%. The proof of concept for this took them, I think, two days. So the idea of maybe we should try this to getting productive results out and operationalizing it. And that's the beauty of something like BigQuery opposed to something you know, more classic like Hadoop is you're managing that infrastructure. There's a lot of complexity to set up. With BigQuery, you just ingest the data and query it. You know, I've seen it ingest a terabyte of data 
and for it to be ready for query within 10 minutes. Um, so the sort of turnaround time becomes really um, a completely different order of magnitude. Um, BigQuery itself, as I mentioned earlier, we've done a, a, about six or eight launches in the last sort of 20 months. Um, and these include uh, some of the things we've talked about, such as Big Join. Uh, we've looked at large query results sets, table decorators for taking the last slice of data. So it helps you manage cost actually really effectively. Um, the Google Analytics in integration, which the next uh, talk is going to focus on a lot more. And then, uh, as I said last week, you know, we're looking at some major sort of changes. And these are the changes, actually, which I, I think really allow it to move into other use cases which are specifically less analytic, like data warehousing. So um, we're taking queries down, from five, uh, down to $5 per terabyte queried, um, so if you, uh, you know, which is an 85% price reduction. The storage is going down to 2.6 cents per gigabyte. So um, I think Motorola holds several petabytes of data in BigQuery, structured storage, available for, for them to, to analyze. And actually, it's as efficient as sticking it in cloud storage, which is amazing. Um, and then obviously, on the streaming side, we're now down to sort of $1 per uh, 10 million rows, I think, um, of ingestion streamed in. Now, that means operationalizing is not going to break the bank. And if you're into sort of really uh, much more structured spending, we are also rolling out some uh, packages to, so you can cap, you can get reserved capacity uh, and manage those budgets much more effectively. So I'm very excited about some of this stuff and what people are starting to do with, uh, with the platform. So I want to go back to this picture. What does it mean for us? I think I want to bring out three key things that I mentioned earlier. First of all, look for the telemetry streams. You know. What are the information feeds that you have? You know, are you storing them? Where are they stored? Are they accessible? Are they being collected scalably, i.e., you're not asking people to fill out forms? Secondly, what are you going to do about identifying these proxies? So how do you bring out? Do you need to join it with other data sets to bring out the intelligence, to start saying, actually, there's a pretty good indicator here for customer engagement. Let's use that. What happens when we act on it? Um, and then finally, all this becomes possible if you've got that agile mindset. You know, I, I think the, the phrase at the end of this is the most important. Can you afford to fail? If you can't afford to fail, you can't afford to innovate. It's really simple. You know, if you're scared of having to go to the CFO and say, I asked you to sign off a million dollars of investment capex to, to do some data crunching, and he asks you, well, what did you get out of it? You say, well, I didn't get anything out of it. It wasn't quite what we thought. The way we are in our businesses today, that is the norm. So unless you can get to this agi agility, unless you can afford to take the, the risk, and you know, for something you put on your credit card, why wouldn't you? So this is what I think big data is about. Taking out the box ticking, taking out the forms, trying to look for those telemetry streams of data which drive true insight, and being as rapid about it as possible.